Good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started now. Our first speaker is going to be Chris French, who is a PGY3 resident in neurology. He's been doing his neuro-ophthalmology rotation. And Chris loves ophthalmology, he says. And um, something that we may not have known about Chris is he was a, uh, he was a golfer at the collegiate level. Okay, In Montana, he was on the, the golf team. And in a tournament, he got a hole-in-one. It was a perfect swish, zero bouncer. Perfect swish, about 180 yards or so. So, s with an eight iron. So, um, that's it. So I took sixth in that one, but uh, our team did not win the tournament. Um, and but I got mentioned in Golf Digest in the magazine, and Derek asked if I had that article, and I don't. I wish my mom would have kept it, but I don't think that she did um, for some reason. So, but anyway, I'm going to talk about. Um, this and then just a couple quick cases associated with this. This is not a topic that um, that I really know about or do, uh, that I've done research with or anything. Um, it's just something that I recently saw while in neuro ophthalmology clinic, um, but I'm sure that I'll see it uh, quite a bit more, um, even if I switch over to ophthalmology or just stay in neurology. Either way, so especially with the high use of these these medications and then all the other new ones that are actually coming out. So. So it'll be seen a lot more. Um, so I'm going to start off with a case and then talk about some other stuff. So this is the patient that we saw. Um, so it was a 44-year-old uh, female who had sudden loss of vision in her left eye. What really happened is, so she woke up on a Sunday morning and then just had really blurry vision and just couldn't really see anything um, down in her just her left eye, she noticed. And she's had dry eyes in the past, but so didn't really think a whole lot about it. But then it just kept on getting worse, more pain in the eye. She ended up going to her optometrist the next day. Um, and the optometrist noticed that there was m possibly a little bit of, of disc swelling. And so he um, ordered an MRI. He was worried about optic neuritis. And so that was actually completed the next day. She went in and had that the next day, but then di didn't get read for two more days. So by the fourth day, she was having a lot worse vision, still just in the left eye, no problems in the right eye that of which she was aware. Um, and um, another symptom that she had been noticing was that she just was going to the bathroom all the time, like 40 times a day or more. Um, and her optometrist ended up calling her and then referred her to neuro-ophthalmology. And so we ended up seeing her uh, last Monday, I think that was. So this is kind of a little more of her story. So by the time she saw us on October 3rd, uh, she felt like she was getting better. She had a lot less pain in her eye um, on movement. Nothing still in the right eye, which she was aware. Uh, and then she felt like her vision was getting a little bit better, especially to light perception and then movement a little bit. Um, she continued to have increasing urgency and she was, like during, during the visit, she had to go to the bathroom probably every 10 or 15 minutes. So her past medical history is interesting. Um, she's she had otherwise been extremely healthy, no other problems until 2009. She was diagnosed with seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. She started on methotrexate at that time, with a little bit of help in in her joint symptoms, but not a whole lot. She got to the point where she was requiring a lot of assistive devices to get around um, most of the time, um, and a lot of and spending a lot of time in the wheelchair because of that. So they ended up. Uh, starting her on Inbril along with the methotrexate as an adjunct therapy, and that was in April of this year. So by the time she saw us, she had been on Inbril for over five months. Um, and then she also had this uh, strange diagnosis of uh, calcium pyrophosphate deposition uh, disease at the same time. They they uh, um, took a sample, uh, they aspirated one of her joints and found, th found that in there. So not gout, but pseudogout. And that was her only surgery, was, is a little bit of debridement of those crystals in there. So her family history is not um, real impressive at all. No MS, no ocular problems in her history at all. And no neurologic problems in the family other than I think a history of migraines. So she's married, she's a fifth grade teacher from Elko, Nevada, no alcohol, tobacco, illicit drugs. Um, and this is her medication list. So the methotrexate and folic acid since 2009, vitamin D uh, Movic, and then the Inbrel, which she was on from um, April 20th to uh, September 22nd, so about five months uh, exactly. And then kind of going back and really getting a better history neurologically, 
uh, to who she had in these other little deficits, kind of an inner history, she did um, ex or complain of um, lower extremity paresthesias, so some numbness and tingling in her bilateral feet about nine months ago, so four months before starting the inbro, that she just associated with either the CPPD or the rheumatoid arthritis that was getting worse. So when she came and saw us, her exam was pretty normal. She, um, she wasn't encephalopathic or anything, uh, no obvious abnormalities looking at her. But then on a neuro exam, so her visual acuity uh, in her left eye was 2200 without correction. She wasn't able to do diopticals or anything. She had an APD that was pretty big in the left eye. Um, she had a near full simple trachoma uh, in the left eye and then a mild right acute in her right eye that she it wasn't symptomatic for her. Uh, and then fundoscopy showed um, a little bit of pallor on the, the left or temporal part of the optic disc. Uh, and then her slit lamp exam uh, demonstrated this little spot uh, on the iris in her, in her left eye, just a little close up um, that we kind of described as this cystic thin lobulated lesion with um, vascularity in the very full capillaries in it. Um, of unknown significance, and she said that she had had that for several years prior. So her motor exam was good. So her reflexes were abnormal, and, and uh, um, she was a little discoordinated. So really brisk, but she had a right upgrowing tear in her uh, clonus, other pathologic find findings, you know, positive Hoffman's and stuff. She had decreased sensation in her right leg, uh, and then she had a positive Romberg. Uh, and she was unable to walk tandem, and she's always attributed that to the rheumatoid arthritis because it's gotten worse over the last two years. So one thing first is that she did bring with her an MRI scan, and um, I could not upload it for whatever reason, but um, this is the one that the optometrist did on September 20th, or that he ordered, and basically what it showed are a bunch of enhancing lesions kind of subcortical and periculosa. So at that time, because of all of her symptoms and everything that was going on, um, we decided um, to admit her to the hospital. So she was admitted, got three days of IV thiumedrol high dose, got a lumbar puncture room consult, and then got uh, further neuroimaging to see what was going on. So her lumbar puncture was positive for oligoclonal bands, uh, but nothing else really. Uh, room said that they agreed with the seronegative, rheumatoid arthritis, as well as the CPPD. And then her MRI, so this is just a flare, actual flare. And so you can see the, the subcortical on the, on her right, on the frontal lobe there, and then some periventricular lesions going here. The side still kind of shows the same thing, callosal, periculosal, and Dawson's finger type uh, looking lesions. And then the GAD enhancing one shows the left optic nerve enhancement and then some other enhancing lesions. Um, so they also imaged her whole spine because of all the bladder issues and her ataxia issues. So this one is um, just a sur uh, uh, image and it shows the demyelination right here, here, just kind of all throughout her cervical spine. But the only enhancing one is um, right there. So the only active lesion that she has is right there, so she has these other older looking lesions. And this is her thoracic spine, so no enhancing ones on thoracic, but um, she has, I don't know if you guys can see these as well um, here, but she has a bunch, uh, T, kind of T1-ish, T8, kind of same, or longitudinally here, and then T11, but nothing enhances, so. So the impression here was probably subclinical or just undiagnosed multiple sclerosis that was either worsened by the TNF alpha uh, antagonist versus demyelination caused directly by the TNF alpha uh, antagonist. So the plan here, and this is between rheumatology and neurology, was to stop the uh, etanercept, which is too bad for her because it was so helpful for her, um, and continue her methotrexate and then steroids, then follow up with rheumatology and possibly use something like rituximab in the future. Um, and then follow up with neurology as well to discuss possible uh, MF uh, with further uh, surveillance neuroimaging. And this is kind of what happens with a lot of these cases that have been reported as this. So it does lead to a few questions. So kind of the big one is, does the patient um, or, or are TNF alpha blockers causing, directly causing CNS demyelination themselves or do they just unmask or worsen previously undiagnosed uh, multiple sclerosis? And so one of the things that uh, has been posed is 
is it a trigger for people without MS but have genetic susceptibility to MS that probably maybe would not have even gotten it um, if they wouldn't have been exposed to this? And so is there an a inexpensive or cost-effective way to screen these people before putting them on one of these uh, CMOS alpha blockers? Um, and there is a long relationship between CMOS B9 diseases and CMOS alpha that I'll kind of um, throw a slide through. Um, and then what do you do for one of these patients? So CMOS alpha, um, as we know, I mean, it's been studied since the 70s. Uh, it's also known as cachectin, but it's a cytokine pro-inflammatory regulator kind of thing that um, it's kind of right at the center of the whole uh, inflammatory uh, cascade. And so it is activated on macrophages as seen in um, the synovial fluid of people with rheumatoid arthritis and things like that. So things that it's used, that, that we use them for now are like rheumatoid arthritis, um, uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, which we'll go into a slide more, uh, psoriatic arthritis, and then things like inflammatory bowel disease and Crohn's disease. So really, the first CNF alpha blocker that people know uh, or have known about is turmeric, um, which has been used in Southeast Asia for a long time. And the big thing is the curcuminoids that are found in turmeric. And this is kind of the one of the main spices that's used in curry or, or a lot of Thai, Thai and Indian food. So they've used it for you know diarrhea, bloody diarrhea, uh, since you know before BC basically, or since BC. And uh, um, now it's being studied. I think. Uh, the NIH has like 13 funded studies just for turmeric uh, and curcuminoids uh, to see if it actually helps with um, inflammatory disease. But the first actual um, FDA approved um, drug was I think Inbrel and I, I put 1998 or 15 but I think that's in, it should be 1998. So Tanercept was the first one for rheumatologic diseases and infliximab was the first one for Crohn's disease. So a little over 10 years of experience with those so far. And the next one was Humira for rheumatologic disease. And then over the last two or three years, there's been these two other new, new ones which um, aren't used even close to as much yet, um, but they are being used more and more. So um, Inbrel and Infliximab, I think there's probably over 300, 400,000 people in the country on those right now for rheumatologic diseases. Um, so most of the studies, or most of the uh, data is collected from people on either infliximab or tanercept um, for prevalence of these diseases. So tanercept, for example, looking back through all the studies, um, the, the incidence of demyelinating disease is about 30 per 100,000 people that are exposed to a tanercept. Um, and the general population, just to kind of compare or put into perspec per perspective a little bit, of people with MS, is about five per 100,000 per year. So there's 8,800 new cases per year of uh, MS that's diagnosed. Um, so it is a lot higher um, for benign diseases associated with CNF alpha blockers. So that kind of raises the question of, or it kind of points more towards directly causing demyelination rather than just unmasking it in previous years. Yep. Right. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, and Yep. So, not a large group. I think the biggest one that I saw was like 15 people at a time with rheumatoid arthritis who had MS at the same time or who were diagnosed with both of them. Um, but I, I think there's a connection. I didn't really look into exactly what the connection was or anything, but I think for a long time, people with psoriatic arthritis, uh, MS, other autoimmune and rheumatologic disease, there's always kind of this connection with these inflammatory diseases, but I don't know. I think people are kind of looking at that still. And so there's not a whole lot of data. The biggest one I saw was 15 people. Um, and the most common symptom associated with a demyelinating disease that they find out that who are exposed to a tanner set is pillow squeezers, and then optic neuritis is the second most common. And the approximate time with the Atanercept, anyway, <coughs> that the FDA has seen is about five months, so it is temporally uh, related that way. So long-term safety, so they did do a meta-analysis of 22 clinical studies uh, with just Atanercept, 
And so interestingly, I'm not sure the importance here, but there are about 4,000 total patients, so 3,300 people, younger people under 65 and then 600 uh, over 65. Interestingly, about eight of them uh, had demyelinating disease that were under 65 exposed to atanercept and none over 65. Don't know the importance there. But there's been no uh, clinical trials of adding atanercept in patients with MS, and there's good reason for that. Um, but other chemotherapy antagonists, one really similar to etanercept that's not FDA approved is linercept, and, and that's been associated with worsening MS. And so I'll show uh, one slide on that. And so just really quickly, um, in, uh, TNF alpha is very associated with these inflammatory diseases. Like I said, it's in the, the synovial fluid of people with rheumatoid arthritis and things like that, but it's also found in high levels in people with active or progressive MS. So it's identified in active lesions in aut autopsy specimens. Um, it's toxic to oligodendrocytes in vitro. It worsens the experimental one with the mouse. When you give mice with this, it actually worsens that. Um, and they have elevated, patients have elevated levels in the serum and CSF in progressive MS, uh, macrophages in MS, patients secrete greater amounts, and there's higher levels of chemo uh, mRNA in red blood cells or other blood cells of people uh, with progressive MS. And so this was really the first big study that really looked at a TNF, uh, or an association between TNF, TNF uh, alpha and um, a multiple sclerosis. And so it was a two-year study, and basically the grad schools would also, really all they did was look at the TNF alpha and the CSF in serum and compare that to how people's uh, physical exam uh, was or their functional exam was. And so it, they just said that there was probably a direct relation between the level of TNF alpha and how uh, badly they were affected. Uh, and, and this is the little mouse model um, that's been around forever since the 1930s that pathologically looks like MS in humans. And so this uh, kind of sparked a little bit of the uh, interest in using TNF alpha antagonists for uh, patients with MS in the 1990s. And so the reason was because when they give TNF alpha to these mice, it actually worsened them, uh, worsened the, the disease and, and killed the mice. Uh, but when they gave them a blocker, TNF alpha blocker, it actually prevented the um, patients, if they got it early, or the mice, prevented them from getting uh, the, the disease. So that just suggested that depleting TNF alpha might be protective in MS. And so that led to this study in neurology. Um, it was basically the linercept, which is the same as a tan very similar to a tanercept, uh, multiple sclerosis study group in 1999. And they actually had to stop this early because the patients were getting <laughs> they were getting harmed basically. So the results were that exacerbations were significantly increased. Uh, they occurred earlier, and their like deficits were more severe than people who were not exposed to linercept but had MS. Um, and so this brought about a little bit of caution from the FDA. They looked at 19 people who were exposed to atanercept or infliximab who had demyelinating disease, and they said that all of these neurologic events were temporally related to the medication. Uh, and then when they stopped it, all of them had partial or complete resolution and discontinuation. So they said avoid these in patients with known or s uh, suspected MS. And so I'm just going to show a couple quick cases. I thought this was funny because this is from the Journal of Rheumatology. Um, so they're advertising for infliximab, but then the, the title of the uh, article is Atanercept Induced MS in Patients with Myelitis. So it's kind of funny. But this was a very similar one to our patient that we saw. Um, so it was a 57-year-old female who had rheumatoid arthritis on methotrexate, then put on a tanercept as an adjunct, uh, and then ended up having demyelinating problems, along with trans or a little bit of transverse myelitis or uh, partial myelitis. So they stopped the tanercept. Her MRI was right there. She had positive ozoclonidon, and it was presumed that she had pre-undiagnosed um, or pre-existing multiple sclerosis, and she had no changes with her follow-up MRI. Um, and that's different than this one. This patient with rheumatoid arthritis um, uh, had blurred, uh, or sudden onset of blurred vision on steady neck. Uh, she continued to get worse after the etanercept. Um, and her initial MRI showed a bunch of lesions, but then follow-up imaging um, showed uh, a bunch more. So one of their conclusions was people tend to get m worsening lesions even up to a year later, and then a lot of times they kind of stabilize but there's not a whole lot of long-term data to really look at these people and see um, if, they, if the MS really um, was exacerbated long-term. 
this one is interesting. I just looked at, this was kind of a review in PubMed of about f of 15 patients with optic neuritis um, who had gotten ventricumab to counter check their autoimmune up. So um, this was looking at the results a year later. So following these patients for a year, um, all with optic neuritis, nine out of the 15 think uh, complete resolution, no new demyelinating lesions, and near um, complete back to the baseline with their vision. So we had partial resolution with some problems, but then four thinking we have new lesions and new symptoms a year later on MR. So their big conclusion was to treat it like uh, any other optic neuritis, so steroid uh, treatment and stopping the, the offending medication. Um, so one of the big questions still that everybody talks about um, is do they cause direct demyelination, or do they just unmask worse than previously undiagnosed or even subclinical multiple sclerosis um, in people that are susceptible? So a lot of people have come up with ideas about tumor necrosis factor alpha um, having to have this kind of balance to make the pro-inflammatory regulation either way um, stable. And so either overproduction or excess of blocking of TMF alpha they say can give rise to this imbalance. And the thought is if there's too much TMF alpha, like known with MS or these other disorders, that it actually just allows cells into places they shouldn't be like CNS. Uh, whereas if you have too little, it doesn't initiate myelation, but it makes it so that it just cannot stop the demyelination. Um, but it sure appears to cause de novo you know, occurrence of demyelination. Um, and there's no long-term data to really see if people are worsened or if they continue to have MS after they're exposed to this. Um, so the only cost-effective way to really look at people with such a low incidence um, is really just see if they're at risk of a family history uh, and then kind of an MS history rather than getting an MRI in all these people. Um, and then the workup should be the same as for like a clinically isolated syndrome or an MS flare uh, in these people putting them on steroids and then doing surveillance and more imaging. And then as we saw, the TNF alpha is definitely associated with uh, multiple sclerosis uh, and it worsens uh, EAE. Um, and then the other thing to kind of just watch out for is as all these new TNF alpha blockers uh, are coming out and uh, are being approved and used for more and more things, um, there's been no reported cases in, in literature on um, the golimumab or the sertolizumab that came out in 2008 and 2009. So these don't even have a label um, in, in their insert label. They don't even have a warning for demyelination um, yet, even though they're so similar to adalimumab. So all the other ones do have uh, um, warnings against demyelination, but those ones don't. And so we'll probably end up seeing something like that in the future. I think so, yeah. Or just the whole cascade of TNF alpha isn't fully understood, um, kind of what it does, especially in people with weird immune systems. Yeah. So the only, so one of the big things was age. So just looking back at the
right, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Katz. He's